Um, I'm Michael O'Donnell. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Communication Journalism, if you haven't met me already. And I'll introduce our panelists. And then what we're going to do is just talk about careers and career paths and, uh, as I told them, life its own self a little bit as well. And you should um, put your hands up if you have questions and anything in particular that interests you. I think we have a nice variety of people here tonight to uh, talk about what they're doing with their communication and journalism degrees. Uh, we'll start with um, uh, just an introduction. Ryan Shaver, sports reporter for CARE 11 and former uh, a sports editor for Tommy Media, right? Olivia Smith is a media planner at Periscope, an ad agency in Minneapolis, right? You know, it's, it's much hipper over there than it is here, right? It's very hip. Zach Neubauer, broadcast associate for the Minnesota Timberwolves, digital media production associate for the St. Paul Saints. And if you need a DJ, <clears throat> I hear he's, he's your guy, right? Yeah, I did Dr. Stoddard's uh, kid's wedding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the best ever. <laughs> and uh, we have Stephanie Keeney here, who Keeney, Keeney, yeah, uh, who's volunteer and learning opportunities coordinator for the American Refugee Committee, a nonprofit. And we have uh, John A. Liné, who's a curator curatorial fellow for the Minnesota Museum of American Art, which I think is. Going to be fascinating to hear how she got into, into that. So let's start with uh, John A. and just tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how you made your journey from communication and journalism student to curatorial fellow. Yeah. Um. So I worked at our history department here at St. Thomas and the gallery, Osmond Art Gallery. You should check it out. I'm sure half of you haven't been there. Because so when I worked there, I think my max and a six-hour shift was probably 15 people. So go check it out. But um, I had no idea I'd end up in the museum field. I um, was a justice and peace minor, and so I was really interested in looking at the world through a critical lens. And um, so I was really interested in how art could be kind of that medium, how we talk about world issues in a fun and engaging way. And um, so my first gig after um, St. Thomas, I worked at the Minnesota Humanities Center. And I, I, like everything in my life, just by happenstance, I started working on their traveling exhibition program. Um, my first day, the woman who was um, managing that program, she was going on maternity leave. So like it was my first day, literally like 10 minutes into the office, she like went to labor. And so they just needed someone to like keep the communication going as you, as one does when someone's on maternity leave. And I just really kind of had a passion for the project. We did the traveling exhibition program was through the Smithsonian Sites program. So to bring the Smithsonian quality work to smaller communities, throughout the states. And so we were focusing on water quality. And with that program, I just learned a lot about the importance of water in my life in Minnesota and just America in general. And so it kind of like reintegrated how much museums and art and exhibitions can help you learn things you never even knew you want to learn about. And um, from that job, I went to a conference, the Minnesota Association of Museums Conference, and met with my now current boss and um, I just was really interested in the museum and what they were doing, and she was interested um, in what the, the Humanity Center. And so we got coffee one day and just like chatted about what do I want to do, what is she doing, and um, so then I saw the job posting, and I already had a connection at the museum. So I met with her and just asked about what like the qualifications were. Like I don't have an art history degree. I just happen to work in the department. I'm working in an exhibition program now, but it's not really focusing on American art and what are the things I should um, focus more in my current job to potentially get the job, and just had a very candid conversation about where I was and where I wanted to be. And um, from that, applied, um, luckily got an interview and just kind of showcased my passion for the art world and how I want to be in the museum field. And luckily, you know, I fooled them, and here I am. And so um, my fellowship is two years, and I'm currently on my second year. It sounds like networking is important. Yeah, that is. Uh... Fake it till you make it is important too. <laughs> For real. <laughs> one, one thing you might be interested in is that uh, the art history department has just started uh, a museum uh, minor, a curator minor. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's several Kojo classes that are included in that interdisciplinary minor. And so 
if, if this sounds like an interesting field, there's actually a pathway now that we have here where you can take that minor and, uh, and double dip with some of your Kojo courses as well. So um, I'm also, I'm just gonna go by areas of intrigue here. They're all intriguing, but I'm, I'm also intrigued in Stephanie's, uh, uh, how she got to into the nonprofit world and at her particular position. Yeah, I had um, a very non-traditional way of getting to where I'm at now, um, mostly just because a lot of my internships um, throughout college, which I know is a huge stress and I've, I love doing, had nothing to do with where I'm at right now. Um, so I'll just give you an idea, just so you kind of have um, an idea of what I'm speaking to. Um, I interned at iHeartMedia and did a lot of journalism work. Um, if, I'm sure you heard of like the Jingle Ball, things like that. I did a lot of interviewing of celebrities. So I did a ton of work in radio. Um, I worked in admissions um, here at St. Thomas. And then I did a patient education internship at Alina Health. So I did internships all over. And that was mainly just because I had a lot of interest in a lot of different areas. Um, I also, um, in addition to my Kojo major, I had a minor in justice and peace and public health. Um, so that exposed me to just um, kind of the advocacy and um, the policy world. And then I also um, did a lot of work with vision here on campus. And so I went on a few vision trips and then I was a student director of the program as well and led a few trips. And that exposed me to the service world um, and also just learning from different cultures. Um, so. I ended up after college um, being really interested in working in more of a service field um, within the nonprofit sector. And the American Refugee Committee works with refugees internationally. So we do work um, within 11 different countries, all internationally, and we provide several different um, services, which really ranges anything from water um, to healthcare to social enterprise services. Um, and I also really wanted to work for an organization and this kind of helped really narrow down um, the nonprofits and the exact work that I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to work for somebody that I believed in, that I felt really passionate about. Um, I wanted to feel connected to the work. And then I also took a ton from um, just my communication ethics course. I really love working for ethical organizations that I truly believe do work um, that is, um, just aligns with my personal values. Um, so I'm working with a nonprofit where we learn about the community, we learn what they would like us to do, and then we help them do it. Um, versus, you know, going into a community and saying like, you need this water, you need this. Um, so I found this amazing organization and then I found a position within it and it's been really fun because my position has grown quite a bit since I've been there. Um, and so I work with volunteers, I do all of the communication and a lot of the coordination with our volunteers domestically and then also internationally. Um, I also work with some of our staff development um, and then not in my job title, which is, happens a lot at nonprofits. Um, I do a lot of our events, a lot of our executive level events. Um, I do a ton of just our interfacing um, and outward facing, um, you know, just communication wise. So there's so many different ways that I can be involved with different things throughout um, the organization and the work that we do. So um, like I said, I really did not think that I was gonna get to where I was right now when I was in school, but it's been, it's been really fun. Um, I see a hand up there, I don't know what, I don't know if we just call on questions. <laughs> yes, I am paid. <laughs> Paid is a fluid term, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and are you speaking to like paid internships or paid work? Like, yeah. Well, don't ever work after school for free. Not a good idea. Um, unless it's volunteer work that'll help enhance your resume, then we can talk more about that. Um, but I would, yes, um, you, you have to search for it. So, um, you know, not, the nonprofit sector is hard because um, there is a lot of, um, I think that there's a lot of stigma that goes with it too, that like, oh, you work in the nonprofit sector, you probably can't afford this. Um, but Honestly, if you're working for a nonprofit that is, works very strategically, um, has a very sound financial, um, just like finance team in general, and knows, you know, it, you know, brings in donor funds, matches grants, things like that, 
normally, and I'm not going it, to, it's, mine's pretty established as well. Normally, you're not going to find a problem getting paid enough. Um, I also would say, um, especially, um, women just don't do this as much as men do, but I would also say make sure that you negotiate your pay always, 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 always ask for more money, no matter what, always do it and overshoot what you want by at least $3 or at least $4,000 because they're probably going to match you in between. Um, normally all employers have some opportunity to pay you more. They just are not going to offer you that right away. So just make sure that you always ask for more money than they offer you. Um, that's just important because your work is valuable. So know that, know your value, know your worth. Um, and please, please negotiate your salaries up. Um, that's just my little plug for negotiating things, but nonprofit world, you can definitely find valuable, really worthwhile work that will get you food on the table as well. It just might take a little bit to search for. And don't be afraid to know your worth and say, in an interview, I, I need to be at this point. If they talk about salary, say, I need to pay, be paid this amount. And don't take the work if you feel like you can't, you can't make ends meet with that. And just a note on that one, if they can't compensate you more, ask for PTO or more money for professional development and other ways you are being benefited and seeing worth. Because those are things that you don't understand what 10 days a year in comparison to 15 days a year really means. And so not every job can offer you more. And in my experience, they can't. But they can offer you those little things to help you feel like your worth is being matched in other capacities. But can I just add, be prepared to get like a flat no to, <laughs> yeah. especially like in my business in, you know, journalism, especially television journalism. I've had two different stations just move on completely from me because I asked for too much money right out of the gate. So it's a slippery slope. I learned as I go, but that's just, just throwing that out there. Well, you know, I, I got to say that having some experience in the working world myself, that, that sometimes it's a signal that's not where you want to work. Oh, it, it's a blessing in disguise. It worked out for the best for sure. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, in this day and age, there's a lot of people that are willing to do a job for, you know, the money that's offered right away. And so if you don't say yes right away, there's somebody else that's going to. I was going to say, I just had my first successfully negotiated hey. Whoa, salary. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Negotiate um, your salaries. Th before that, I just kind of chose to work eight jobs simultaneously, which is not, I'm not kidding. <laughs> that's, that's what I've been doing. Which you can do, so, like not eight jobs, but I do work an, an extra part-time position. If you have the capacity to do that, you can do that too. If you're really passionate about where you want to be, and just like John A said, sometimes they say, no, like I, we really cannot give you any more than this. Um, especially at nonprofits, there are sometimes, you know, there, there's stricter finances because you're spending donor money, things like that. Um, you can always find a part-time job, even if it's really small. And that way, you know, the first few years after college, you might be able to um, work somewhere that you're really passionate about, that you feel like you're making a difference at, but you're also able to afford things. Um, and so there's always flexibility with that too. I want to hear more about, uh, and then we'll get to the two tradition, more traditional uh, <laughs> uh, career paths here, more about uh, Zach's uh, piecing together of several jobs. And Yeah, so out of college, I was uh, looking for jobs and it was taking a bit to hear really a ton back. And so the first, I, I applied, I was just trying to keep myself busy, so I applied for a job writing for like a rec league basketball website where they covered rec basketball games. And they ended up actually needing somebody to run the leagues too. And I, I kind of was looking at it like, I need a job that you, know, you, you, that you get money for, um, but also one that I can start doing some things that I want to be doing. And this one had opportunities to do video stuff, writing, reporting, um, they wanted to do podcasts covering these leagues. If you guys are basketball fans, Ultimate Hoops, go check it out. It's a lot of fun. Um, but I took that job, and then the cool thing about it is it was kind of a blank slate for me. I got to, like, you know, uh, do whatever I wanted to. So I was making videos that had, like, uh, Star Wars-inspired graphics coming up and all sorts of stuff that you don't really need. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Sure. How much were you paid? For that one? Yeah. Uh, about 30 grand a year. Really? I know, you'd expect it to be less. <laughs> um, the tough thing with that job was that it slowly started turning away from, you know, the things that I really liked about it. It started becoming more, you know, managing officials and, you know, people stopped showing up because they suck. 
And, uh, and I spent a lot of time like, oh, I'd really like to be shooting a video right now, but I have to take stats because our stats guy didn't show up. Or uh, I have to ref a game and I haven't refed basketball since like middle schoolers in high school. <laughs> so um, it got really frustrating and I was, I was looking for a way to kind of move on. I kind of felt stuck there. And I, it, I applied for, or it, did you want me to talk about all the piecing together of jobs too or oh, no? I, I'm none, starting to get really none into of, like, none Zach of it's history. gonna be like war and peace. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the piecing together, uh, I kind of looked at like what are the things I want to be doing, and what can I, what do I need to have to live right now? So the ultimate hoops job kind of turned into what I need to live now. But I took a part-time job at a radio station, iHeartMedia again, uh, and was doing some board hopping. Um, I'm still there. I do uh, I, I do the overnights for Alt 93.3, uh, and then I help out with KFan here and there. Um, I started calling football games for Stillwater High School. I started uh, uh, doing some stuff for a cable access TV station. Um, I, and then I was like looking to get out of Ultimate Hoops and there was an internship with St. Paul Saints. And I was like, oh great, not gonna get paid, but it'll be more in line with what I wanna do. And so I applied for it and they just happened, I'm really the luckiest guy in the world. Uh, they just happened to have a full-time position there and, <laughs> and we're like, you'd be better for this. And I'm like, thank you for paying me. And do you do, do you do off season or just in season? So they just created the position. So it was a full time seasonal position. So it's for the, only for the summer. And um, and they said they weren't sure if they were going to be continuing it on year round. And so I took the job, uh, did the summer, and at the end of the summer they were like, we're still working on it. Go find something else to do. And so I applied for a job as a PA with the Timberwolves, and then. Um, they asked me to come on full time because they needed somebody, and so now I'm full time with the Timberwolves, uh, uh, making not a ton of money, but doing a lot of fun stuff. And then the Saints just offered me a year-round full-time thing, so now I'm going back to do that uh, when the Wolves season ends. Now you might be and I DJ weddings. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Shameless plug. Yes, you might be picking up some some themes here. Uh, and it's one that they're common themes that we've had in the past with this panel, not these exact people, but with other panels. And that is that there's a, a world of opportunity out there in communication and journalism. It's just not the kind of opportunity where you step into a $42,000 a year uh, job with benefits. You, you have to be entrepreneurial to some degree. Uh, you have to be willing to start small. We're going to hear about Ryan Shaver starting very small, and uh, and you have to be willing to uh, be light on your feet and, and move around. Let's uh, let's hear from. Oh, also, you, you may be hearing the word internship a lot. Yeah, and we have about uh, typically about ninety percent of Kojo majors uh, take internships, and uh, I like I like students to take them for credit because I think they're more structured. But a lot of people take two internships. You can use your studentness to. Uh, Kind of make a wedge into uh, various industries, and and like I say, sometimes sometimes they become more like uh, extended tryouts rather than than just an internship. So to speak to that a little bit, um, I took an internship while in school with iHeartMedia, and at the end of it, um, like a couple months later, I got called in and uh, interviewed. They they requested that I come in and interview for the producer job for the City's 97 morning show. And I interviewed for it, didn't get it. And then they hired a new program director and he invited me in to interview for the job again when it came open. Interviewed, didn't get it. And then like a couple months after that, they called me and said, we have a part-time job that you should just take. And so if you get in the door with an internship and they like you, they will try to make stuff happen for you. People like having people that they like around. Yeah, and and it also is another thing that I've long said, and and when I do career counseling, is that that no doesn't. If somebody brings you in for an interview, no doesn't really mean no. It means not now. Very often that's the case, and and so you always want to leave those interviews with a good taste in your mouth. But let's hear about uh, Ryan, and then we'll then we'll get to the world of advertising after that. Sorry for being late. First off. I had like a weird flashback just, of coming just, through that door I, I, late. It's it was, just like the class time. I know. Just, it was like being just, back in school like again. Back I looked up and you just had this look of disapproval. Yeah. Actually, you were. <laughs> actually, right by, before he came in, he was like, hopefully Ryan Shaver joins us. <laughs> oh, man. Well, the, it's actually, it's it's uh, by 
student, uh, official student starting time, uh, he was early. Yes. So there you go. Well, there we go. Yeah, so I, uh, who, who's all in Tommy Media here? Is there anybody that knows Tommy Media? A couple people. Okay. So, yeah, I did Tommy Media when I was here. I, I did, was a reporter one year, and then the sports editor, then the production editor, and then by my senior year, second semester, I was the director. And used that experience to really help me find a job because that was like my whole resume. I interned at CARE 11, um, but they don't let you do a whole lot at TV stations. And you'll find that for the couple people that are in time media, like a lot of the stations won't let you use the cameras. Like most of the time you're just doing grunt work. So you don't get a real good chance to put a tape together at those places. So like almost all of my stuff in my resume was from time media and I credit MOD and um, Professor Vandegrift big time for setting me up to get a job. So I was looking, I wanted to stay around here. I didn't want to go anywhere far. Um, and so I applied basically in the Rochester market. There's three stations there. Mason City, what, a station that was in Austin, that's now in Rochester, and then a Rochester NBC station. I applied to all three of those, ended up working in Mason City, which is market 151. It's a town of like 30,000 people. It's in the middle of nowhere, nothing going on. And it was rough, and I made no money. It was like, I made like $27,000 my first year, and they made me sign a three-year contract. So it was not glamorous. It was long hours, and I was salaried. So, you know, there was two guys in our sports department, me and AJ, and we were it. I produced. I shot all my own stuff. I anchored. I edited. I wrote everything. And, you know, everything needed to get covered. So most of my days, I'd come in at like 8 a.m., shoot a wrestling tournament, pop down, you know, shoot basketball, you know, whatever else is going on, come back, anchor the five, anchor the six, go out again and shoot whatever the big stuff that was going on that night, do the 10. So it would be like 13-hour days when I was getting paid for eight. And that's the norm. Like, that's how most jobs are when you start. And I saw a lot of people get out of the business because of it. But life does get better after that. Um, after the three years there, um, I was looking actually to switch from sports to morning news and was going to go to Des Moines to do that. But luckily, CARE 11 heard that I was uh, looking to go to Des Moines, and they came in and offered me a great contract to be the sports reporter there, like the number three guy. Um, and I've been there almost three years now. So it's been great. I do pretty much everything in our department from anchor. You can see me on TV anchoring. You might see me reporting. I shoot all of our video in the sports department. I edit everything. And I also produce back there, too. So pretty much everything that happens within our sports bubble, I have a hand in. I also run our website. So Now, um, th there's a couple of things that I want to uh, kind of expand on. Yeah. And the first, the first is that if you, if you are in, in Tommy Media and you're looking at as a part-time job, that's not the right attitude. Because what he's telling you is that it's a portfol portfolio building uh, opportunity that over the course of, of doing it over and over again, you can attain virtually professional quality in your work, and then that portfolio is going to look good. The other thing I want to say is that this hasn't changed for uh, 40, the 40 years I've been in the business, that it hasn't changed a bit. Uh, my first job was at a paper of 3,000, and I was paid $140 a week, uh, and uh, averaged about 65 hours a week. So it's, but if you can bear with it, the next job is, might be, might be better. And I, I've said this a lot, but like when you're in these small markets, like you're there with a lot of other people that are just starting out. And so you have like a lot of people like in the trenches with you, so to speak, and they become really good friends and you hang out with everybody. So like you got good people to get you through. And, and I will say the business is starting to change. Like I haven't been in it for that long, maybe seven years, six, six, seven years, but I'm seeing more and more college students now who are going into TV skip going to the like market 151 where I started with and going right to like a middle sized market. I've seen a lot of kids go to like Madison right away or even Green Bay. And like that was unheard of when I first started out. Like there was always a very clear path, like start in a very small market. Take a lot of chances, make a lot of mistakes, figure out who you are, discover your voice, which is the biggest thing in this business. It's just like, learn to be yourself. And that sounds super easy, but it's super hard. Like, everybody knows like what a TV voice sounds like and everybody's trying to imitate everybody on TV, but the best way to be is just to be you. And you have to learn that within uh, the first couple years of this job, but then you're supposed to move into like a middle market. That's when you go to Madison and then you jump to a big market. So like. 
when I jumped from Mason City to Minneapolis, that was like, oh, crazy at that time because nobody else was doing it. But now it's like completely different. It's like the wild, wild west. Like stations are just plucking people right out of college. It's blowing my mind. I just don't know how you could go right from college into a market like Madison and expect to do well. It just seems really scary. Well, I, I know that in, in my first job, I made plenty of mistakes and nobody cared. Exactly. I mean, that a was few the beauty people of cared, but not many people cared. Not many. I, yeah. I made plenty in Mason City, but it was Mason City, so it was okay. Yeah. yeah, that's the great thing about my radio job right now is that I'm on a station nobody gets at a time slot nobody listens, so I can kind of just say whatever I want. Yes. And... <laughs> <laughs> but you, it really helps you kind of find your voice to what he was saying. Like, yeah. you start talking, it's like, all right, this is going on the radio. And then you start talking, and you're like, who was that guy? No. I don't know who that is. And then, like, after a while, you start working your way into, like, what you should sound like. And, and you want to, one thing you always want to keep in mind is that you get in those places, but you, you my, my practice was to always pretend I was at the uh, New York Times. You always want to always do your best and not do something that, uh, I mean, we talk about mistakes, they're honest mistakes, but you don't want to do something crazy that then shows up, especially today in the internet age, that shows up later uh, when you're when you're working at CARE 11 finally, and then somebody says, did you hear what, hear what this guy did, you know, and, right. and they have the tape, so. For, and, you, and you also never know who's watching or who's reading your stuff or who's listening, because like when my contract was coming up in Mason City, I started getting emails from news directors who were like, hey, I was driving through one time, saw you on there, like heard your contracts up, or I called your news director about you, and blah, blah, blah. And so like, to MOD's So point, always do your, always always do your, do your best. best. Always do your best. And, and what also what that'll do is you'll end up with portfolio pieces that actually are good. Right. And that's another thing. We get to hear from uh, from the world of advertising and, and uh, uh, the kind of things that uh, got Olivia to where she is. Yeah, so I was a non-traditional college student. I was in the military before I came to St. Thomas. And when I came to St. Thomas, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was like, oh, communications and journalism is a broad enough major where I can kind of just fake my way to finding a job. And I wasn't too pigeonholed. Um, and so I kind of just did different kinds of internships while I was um, in school. I worked at 92 KQRS at the morning show. Um, I was in the call center for the Minnesota Twins. Um, and then I just kind of took some advertising classes. I was like, hey, this is kind of cool. Um, I'm going to try this. Um, and I'm going to plug Tommy Media as well, especially for ad and PR people. Um, I was on the ad sales team, and then I was the ad and PR director. And that really taught me a lot about the industry. Um, and just kind of all the communications um, and PR ad and PR classes you can take at St. Thomas like really help for the future. <laughs> especially Paul Obot's class, this 400 level class. Like I'm a media planner at Periscope and that class pretty much teaches you how to run media campaigns. Um, so I applied to a bunch of internships after college. Um, there's a ton of advertising internships. Um, so a lot of big ones and they're super competitive at like Olson, Carmichael Lynch, Fallon. And it was a little bit intimidating for me. So I went towards the smaller um, ad ag agencies so I got a job at or an internship at Space 150. Um, it's a digital um, only advertising agency. Um, and then I was there for three months and I got hired on full time. Um, so I was there for about a year and a half. And it just kind of reached in advertising. If you're usually at an ad agency for three years or more, you're usually have been there too long. Um, so it was kind of my time to you know try a new agency since I've been there from being an intern to full time. So then I'm now working at Periscope as a media planner. So I really didn't know anything about media planning. I knew all about like being an account person and project management. Um, and I really didn't know that much about media um, until I kind of got my internship. So as a media planner, I plan and execute media campaigns. So right now I'm working on clients, um, BASF, which is a chemical agricultural company, Optum, which is part of United Healthcare and Basilica Block Party. So we kind of plan and execute these campaigns across all disciplines, across digital, PR, social, out of home, print, and broadcast. Um, so we kind of are well-rounded and um, reaching our target audience for our clients. Were you in, were you in my web class? I was, yeah. yeah, in the web class too. And so that helped, that helped. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We have a much better web teacher now, John Keston, but uh, that, that seemed to be a hot class at mm -hmm. the time for for people moving into job. Do you have a question out here? Yeah. 
Yeah, so a lo- there's like just a lot of turnover. Um, so the thing with advertising is they kind of work you to the bone um, where if you want to get a raise or if you want to get a pay increase or if you want to get promoted, you kind of have to go to a different ad agency um, to get that recognition you deserve. Um, it's kind of a doggy dog world in advertising. Um, so yeah. That's, it's, it's not uncommon. Um, it's not uncommon in, in any profession that you go into where you're working for somebody. And uh, I had this, <laughs> I know this is gonna sound very strange. I had this happen to me. I was in Davenport, Iowa at the newspaper there. And the feeling was, well, you can't be very good if you're working for us. Uh, it was sort of a, you know, sort of an attitude. We're, we're a, sm- a medium-sized market. Isn't that paper. a, there's like a joke that's like, I don't want to be a part of any club that would have me. Yeah, that's I think exactly. that's Woody Allen, maybe. That was uh, Groucho Marx. Groucho thing. Marx, there yeah. you go. So, uh, so uh, when I, my next job then from there was the Chicago Tribune. And, and that's the kind of move you had to make because uh, there wasn't a lot of room for promotion. Sometimes you run into that too. There's not a lot of room for promotion, but... But there really is a, a matter. If you're working for us, we've got you. Why should we do anything for you? And and that's not that's not uh, uncommon in, in a lot of industries. Um, other questions? Can we open it up for some questions here. Or anybody interested in what's going on? No. Yeah. Um, so I, I probably, well, I don't know. I don't know which, a lot of people worked at Tommy Media here and a lot of people had more ad PR. Did you work We there? did. Yep, you yeah. two did. And then I you'd, did too. You, see, yeah. everyone did. I didn't. But um, I'm not saying it's, it's wonderful to work for though. I just was doing a lot of other things. Um, I had a, a different, a more niche, I would maybe say. I don't know what it, what, how it's grown since, I've, um, since I graduated in 2016. Um, I had more of a rhetoric pathway, so it was a little bit different. Um, but I found that the things that I learned in my classes were honestly and truly, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on a panel, we're applicable to everything that I do on a daily basis all the time. And that's not just at work, that's also in my personal life. Um, And I think that as you carve out your path, Kojo gives a lot of room for fluidity, which is really helpful. I was looking at a lot of colleges before I decided on St. Thomas that had Um, more structured paths. So initially, actually a long time ago, I was looking to become a broadcast journalist um, and do the news. And I decided that I wanted to be somewhere that was a little bit more fluid. And I changed my path quite a few times. So I started out more in broadcast and journalism. Then I went more to ad and PR. And then I found my way um, through rhetoric. But find the courses that you feel passionate in. Find the courses that you're sitting in and you really, really want to be in. And sometimes that's every class for people. Um, that does happen. I, I was a student who like sat in the front row and loved every class. But sometimes it's not that. And find those classes that really, you know, get your mind racing, that you want to talk about, that you want to tell your family about. Those are the classes um, that you are being called to and that I think that that can carve out the path. Also, don't be afraid to change paths. Don't be afraid to have um, interesting paths. Um, I think for me, the best thing about my very diverse Um, internship um, world and path is that I have been able to, at every job that I've had, um, take on projects that are not part of my job description that has exposed me to different departments and has carved the way to me getting promotions. I'm right now, and um, my job, like my job title right now is kind of interesting, but right now I'm working with our entire exec team to carve out a new position that's just been created for me. And I'm not saying that to be like, whoa, I did a great job. But I was able to work on a lot of projects that are not within my job scope. So I did a lot of design things. Um, I did a ton of project management. I've been doing a lot of um, just like social media things. So tons of things that are not within my job scope that people have noticed and they've been able to find better positions for me within that organization that play more to those talents. Um, So really don't be afraid to explore different things that might not fit with what your path looks like. Um, and your path might look totally different next year or next semester. That's okay. I often talk about the fact that I'm in my dream job right now, 
but my dream job might look different next year. It might look different in five years from now, and that's all okay. Um, or if you're like, I want to be a broadcaster, that's awesome too if you know that and you want to focus on it. Um, so that's just a little bit. Uh, as far as classes go, I think one of the ones that really stuck out to me was uh, Vandy's reporting class, which I didn't get super into a reporting world, but just taking a class where you can tell that the professor like really cares and he really, really like, cares, really cares and really like almost imposes the desire to to just be inside of like a Watergate conspiracy. Uh, but <laughs> Vandy saved me from switching out of journalism. I was going to jump ship and go be a lawyer, but he talked me down on the edge <laughs> and ensure like he's pretty hard on people in his class. Well, like, and that's, he, and he's that's not the afraid takeaway. to like, rip your stuff apart, which is great. But then I just thought I sucked. I was like, oh man, I'm not good at this. Right. At all. Right. It, but it, he assured it, me that you really got to give a shit about what you're doing, uh, in that class in particular. Sorry for the language my bad. Uh, the, <laughs> but it, it, you know, it's, the thing I took away from it was find what you're passionate about and do it the best that you can. He was very passionate about reporting and it made you want to do it like so hard. And even if, it, you know, anyway, moving on, other courses. I like the technical ones. Uh, we did, uh, I think it was digital media production was a fun one for me, but I also do, like that's the stuff that I like is getting in, creating, making that stuff. That was the class of the digital imagery and sound. Is that, is that what mean? it was? I that's couldn't remember the actual That's title. the one where you did the Chino movie? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, he also did the James Bond spy <laughs> movie, and I think I've got that stored <laughs> away somewhere, too. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was just because I couldn't find anybody to interview. Um, I would say, well, you all, what everyone said, in a sense, but also, like, find a professor who will be your biggest advocate. And um, people who, like, as I was a messy 19-year-old, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had no idea, like, if I had dreams, passions. I was like, I think I like talking, but what does that mean? And find people who, like, will be listening, like, who are willing to listen to you word vomit about your future. And I was lucky enough to have my um, advisor be that person. But find a professor. It does, potentially doesn't have to be someone in your, like, kojo. But find someone who really, like, sees something in you and what you can potentially do next year and years to come. And especially when you leave, I'm still a confused 25-year-old, but um, people you feel you can reach back out to later on who still cares about you two years down the line, three years down the line. And when I was undergrad, I had no want to ever go to grad school, but now that I'm out, I really want to go to grad school. And just thinking about what you're doing now is going to make a difference for what you do in the future. Like the papers you write, care about them. 30 pages is a lot, but care about it. Care about the topic. Care about those kind of things because... They're going to what kind of propels you for your next whatever big opportunity. So find a big advocate at St. Thomas for yourself. And go to your professor's office hours. Like, I know it sounds super lame, but, like, go. Because you never know when you need a recommendation. Like, CB, like, recommended me. Like, he wrote a recommendation letter for me. And, like, I never thought I would have a professor do that for me. So, like, go to your professor's office hours and just, like, talk to them and kind of pick their brains. Um, I... My advice has always been, um, when, I, when I have students come in, prospective students, is that you should be forming a relationship with a different professor every semester. And, and that means you, get, you, you, you would need to take a variety of classes, and of course some of us uh, end up with the same students in every class, it seems like. But if you can, if you can form those relationships, and, and Tommy Media is a great place, because we have, we have six people working down there that you can get to know. Uh, that, that will help you out. Sometimes it's just advice you need. Sometimes it's um, a recommendation letter. Uh, when, and when you're starting out, the people who are going to give you the best recommendation uh, would be that, that person who has seen your work and can, can talk about the good things you've done and, and so forth. Well, and, and I'll say, too, I don't think any class is going to give you a complete set of knowledge or skills that you, you're going to need going forward. Like, I, I took a lot of classes where we worked on videos, we did audio editing, but you go out in interviews and the first thing they'll ask you about is, is After Effects and making like motion graphics, which is something we never got to because we were still learning the basics. You gotta kind of be willing to go out and learn stuff on your own. It's sort of a, a wet your beak type of thing with a lot of these classes and then if you wanna pursue it, just really you gotta dive in and, and kind of self-teach yourself a little bit too. I think that's why when I look back now, like I did a lot with Time Media, but I wish I would have done even more 
because of what you just said, like you're allowed to like go out there really on your own and like do different things all the time. Like I would cover so many different stories in a week and I wish now I could have like teleported back and really have like taken more chances or done things differently or tried to do more video package or more audio slideshows because I mean, you can't replace experience. And like that first year on the job for me was like, was really like a fifth year of college. Like I learned so much. And I, but I was leaps and bounds ahead of other people that were starting there with me because of Tommy Media. But like Tommy Media could have set me up even better if I would have really taken advantage of it. One thing you got to remember is that um, any class, I'll use an example. I taught the editing class for many years. And we would do, uh, over the course of a week, we might edit, uh, seriously edit three pieces, stories or some other thing. Uh, so over 14 weeks, that comes out to, I don't know, 60 or 70 pieces. Maybe Probably not even that many. Probably didn't do that many. Uh, that's less than a week's work on a, on a copy desk. And that's true of, of what you were doing, Ryan. You, you can shoot for Tommy Media, and you might do a package a week or something One like that. One a week, and you get out in the real world, and it's, <laughs> it's maybe two a day sometimes. But, but what that gets you is it, it teaches you to be good and fast. That's one thing it does. And in any profession, uh, you have to learn to work up to speed. Now, it may not be that that, that speed is breakneck like what you're doing there. At your, at your job, John A., it might be uh, just making sure you can get done and meet deadlines. But but you you can't get there without practicing, and, and that's what you get out in the real world. It's a rep. So I'm sure you're in the advertising, it's that way, too. Yeah. Um, There's never not a deadline, and it's never not like looming over you and you're never not ahead of it. But there are a lot of, I feel like we've been kind of like, oh, everything's so hard. You're not gonna get paid anything. Like everything's It's a scared suck. straight seminar. But no, it's, 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 <laughs> it's really amazing. It's, I mean, I think that th there's so many amazing things you can do um, and you truly understand the impact that you can have as a human being, just working alongside people and learning from them. Um, I do want to give a really quick shout out to Dr. Sauter and Dr. Peterson. Um, they were some of my favorite professors. Take a course from them if you can. Um, but I know that a lot of people have said the same thing on the panel, but a lot of people will ask me what I loved about St. Thomas. And my biggest thing that I say is that I had professors who cared in the classroom, but also cared about me outside of the classroom and about me after I graduated. Um, I've done a lot of applying to grad schools in the past year, and Dr. Peterson, Dr. Sauter have helped me a lot throughout throughout the process. Um, and it's just been exceptional to have people that are there for me after I graduate. They have, I mean, there's like no buy-in for them right now. Like I'm not in their class, I'm not reviewing them on rate my professor, but they are they're they're just doing this because they care about me as a student and as a person, and that that's huge. Um, so find those professors that will be your advocates and will be um, those people on the sidelines for you too. But it doesn't all suck. It's, it's tons of fun too. Um, it, it is it really a lot of is. fun. <laughs> uh, um, so I was going to ask, what's the worst thing about your job? But that, that would turn a total upper into a total, <laughs> a total downer. But, uh, but what, are, what are some pitfalls that you, that you would say look out for as you're out there? think you're now because they had no pitfalls this group here had zero no I think um especially like your senior year at St. Thomas at least how I did my senior year I was involved with a lot of programs I was you know like leader of this president of this and like really felt like I was sure of who I was and then you get to your first job and you're asked to make name tags to do printer copies and you're like I had so much I want to do and I want to run a program and I know how we can make this better but like you still have to do your dues and I know you don't want to be all negative, but like, you're still going to have really shitty tasks. I mean, you're still going to be treated like an intern in some jobs, and like you're going to do like take notes about all the board meetings that you don't want to. Like it's just what you do your first couple years out. Yeah, like with the Timberwolves, I get to, you know, I get to shoot like pregame press conferences. Uh, you get to go in the locker room, you know. You, but I also have to go get water from across <laughs> the street, and, and that's as a full-time employee. I have to go get like water and stack it, and make sure that that's there for the people who are working. You know, I have to go climb underneath the 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 stands to run triax cables that are just the heaviest thing that you can imagine, and they don't look that way. <laughs> like you hold a cord and you're like, oh, this feels nice, and then you hold a triax and it feels like you're holding a brick. But it, you like, there's so many things that like you just got to do. And, and sometimes, sometimes it's hard, but you just got to do it. And people will, you have to do it because people need to know they can trust you. And it, you want to be the person that they, 
rely on when they have something that comes up. They, they want to be like, oh, we can send Ryan because we know Ryan will get this done. Uh, we can send Zach because we know he's going to get it done. You know, I've worked with PAs that, you know, sit there and complain and are constantly, they don't even know how to focus the camera and, like, and, and are asking a million questions that they've answered a million times already. And people get annoyed with that and they'll stop asking you to do things and then they stop thinking about you favorably. I would just say, I touched on this earlier when I first spoke, but just have like realistic expectations about like what you're getting yourself into. Like a lot of like coworkers at my first market, I think they expected to get like paid a lot and it was going to be glamorous because you're on TV all the time and it was not that at all. And I watched a lot of people come in and out that door and a lot of people leave the business. A lot of people that started here at St. Thomas that didn't last more than two years doing the TV stuff. So just like have realistic expectations like but make the most of it just like learn to to breathe and and relax and realize that like job is great job puts food on the table job pays the bills but there's a lot of other stuff outside of that and so to make sure to like you keep a healthy balance between life and the job I can't preach how important that is especially when you first start out and you're running yourself ragged really important to like not lose yourself in that and and take time for yourself too if you have a one, one thing I Learn this if you if they if you have a night off you take the night off and, and like you're off then you're, like you're off. not checking your email you're not answering your phone you're off right That's you know and, big... and I had bosses be like hey I called you to have you come in I'm like oh, I'm sorry I was out of town or whatever because I, I just take learned my phone off the hook on nights off exactly because if you don't they're gonna take advantage of you and they're gonna have you come in I mean there's always stuff going on and and just think about in the world like there are so many different things happening all the time I was off when the Kirk Cousin stuff broke uh, lost my day off that day you know like just got to roll with the punches sometimes like the tip my mother kept asking how come your phone's always busy and so that was a problem <laughs> well i was just gonna say like you know i got married right out of college and that's that can be tough too if if any of you are dating uh but when you first come out and you're just busting your butt trying to to make a career for yourself uh, and trying to nurture a relationship and find time for them, that's that's really hard. Like, it's still hard. Like, I was at the Target Center until I came here, and then I'm going from here to the radio station. I'll be there till midnight. So there are, there are, it's, it can be very long days. And so, like you said, if you do get a day off, just take it and throw your phone in a river. <laughs> Last thing I'm going to add is just like, and this seems super obvious, but you'd be surprised. It's like, just work your butt off, like, when you get there. Like, there's a really big um, stereotype about people in our age demographic that we're entitled and we're these millennials who are used to participation trophies and we're not working hard. Like people think that about you when you get out there, especially older coworkers. Prove them wrong. Like come in early, stay late. Like that's the reason I'm here now. Is like I, I treated it like sports. Like I played sports in high school in like the best way to get ahead in sports is to work harder than everybody else. If you don't have the talent, then like bust your butt. And so do that, like show your bosses, show your coworkers that you're committed and that you want to do well, ask a lot of questions, find people who are better than you at whatever job you do and pick their brain, ask for criticism, have them just tear your stuff apart because that's the only way you're going to get better. If people say you're great and you're doing great all the time, you're not going to get better from that. You're never going to learn. Like always try to get, to do more. I want to uh, ask um, uh, Stephanie, she's applying to graduate schools. Mm, yeah. And that's a path that some of you might be interested in taking too. Uh, and so uh, maybe she could just uh, expound on how that process has gone trying to get into a PhD program. Yeah, so I'm currently applying to, uh, well, I've applied to five schools. Um, over this past year for acceptance to fall 2018. Um, all of them have been PhD programs um, or combo MA PhD programs, and then one is a terminal MA program, and they're all in communication um, within more of a uh, an emphasis area of rhetoric. Um, and I won't bore you with more of the details, mm -hmm. but um, it's, I mean, it's hard. It's a lot of hard work, um, especially when you are working a full-time job and you're really passionate about your full-time job. Um, so it, it's a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of time. Um, I would for sure recommend um, if you're going to take the GRE or you haven't already, 
please look at your flashcards and read your books. Um, my score went up like a, a scary amount my second time that I took it. I was actually worried if any schools got both my scores that they would think I had somebody else take it for me um, or I was doing something crazy because my score went up um, like 20 points. 20 points in one, just one subject area, and I think 30 in another, which is an insane amount, but that was just because I actually took time to sit down and study, um, and I would normally not admit that to a large group of people, um, but I, I'm gonna be very transparent with you. Um, so for sure, study. Um, notify your professors if you want recommendations let letters early in the game. I actually reached out to Dr. Peterson and Dr. Sauter and then um, a few other professors, probably too early, I, maybe too early. Um, I reached out in March um, and the applications were mostly due in December. Um, and that was March of obviously the prior year. So I reached out quite, um, quite a while in advance just because I wanted it to be on their calendar. I also have a dad who's a professor and he gets recommendation letter requests sometimes like a week before. Sometimes professors are willing to do that, but be respectful of their time. Um, also be just respectful and honest when you ask them and be like, I understand if this isn't something you're comfortable doing or you're wanting to do, um, and don't take it too hard if a professor says no. Maybe they're just, you know, they're on sabbatical, they're doing something. Um, so do a lot of research about the schools that you wanna go to, do a lot of research about the professors that you wanna study with, um, know that. I had um, a, a Co colleague, I'll say, of mine who did minimal research and when they called them in for an interview for grad school, um, it was really embarrassing um, because they didn't know what to speak to at all. So do research, make sure that you are hoping to match with people's who, people who have your area of interest um, so that you're not like, oh, I wanna study with that professor, but they are doing something totally different or they're on sabbatical or they're retiring. And like, then it just looks like you did no research. Um, write your you know, your um, letter of intent early, get a lot of feedback. Don't be scared for the feedback that you're gonna get. I sent it to 12 different people and got edits. I literally had probably seven drafts. Um, and, you know, just make sure that you're taking time to do that, but also take time off of doing that. Now this is um, uh, for graduate school and the graduate school application can be daunting as well. Yes. Uh, so that's what she's talking about. There's a lot of work, but there's also the element that that uh, uh, Olivia could speak to because she's talking about uh, having to move around in the advertising world and that's uh, uh, keeping your resume up to date and keeping your, your what we call a string book, but now it's probably called a portfolio up to date. Well, and just everyone like right now, if you don't have a LinkedIn, get a LinkedIn mm -hmm. because that's how I actually got my job through Periscope. And get a string book too, just because. Yeah. <laughs> but just go buy one just to see what it is. Well, string book is this. This is a, this is in the back when dinosaurs ruled the earth, and, yeah. and we actually used paper to communicate. And and a string book was simply uh, uh, where you kept all your clippings, and uh, and you and I was. Uh, was it made of string? No, it's called a string book. I don't know. I don't don't don't. Okay, I'm sorry. Don't taunt me. Okay, don't mock me. <laughs> Olivia, break. But, continue. No. Yeah, but the, uh, the 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 equivalent today would be. Uh, some sort of digital portfolio and you have you guys have it uh, you think you have it uh, easier because you don't have to be printing things out making copies and, and making them nice and neat on the page and everything but the fact is that keeping a digital portfolio is in some ways more difficult uh, because if, if for another reason than maintenance uh, throwing bad stuff uh, not bad stuff but throwing stuff out when you have new stuff coming in that's something that's superior to it you, you have to work on keeping that up to date and you have to work on keeping your uh, resume up to date and understanding uh, you know, the purpose of the resume and, and uh, uh, how to, uh, what to put in it. I always recommend getting some resume help. There's lots of help online uh, to, and you can just buy, you know, look at, find models of those things too, but, but, but you can start now on that. If you're going to be doing internships and such, you can start on it now, and you don't have to worry about, well, I don't have a lot of experience. Um, if you have classwork, you can put your classwork in there, you can put examples from your classes, and you also can uh, uh, put your job at uh, uh, Burger King or whatever else is in there. If they, wanna, if they see that you're working, that's valuable too.
excellent yeah. question. I wanted to be a social worker. Um, so I took a social work class and I was like, nope. Um, and then just with the communications too, I was just like, I still don't know if it's right for me to be honest. Like they keep talking about, I wish I had passion like everyone else on this panel, but I'm like, you know what? For right now, advertising is right for me in this moment. And that totally can change down the line. And like, I know that. Um, so it's kind of just like, I'm keeping my options open because you never know what tomorrow could bring, which sounds really corny. Um, but just like keep your options open because you really don't know. So if you don't have a passion, that's totally fine. Like I still got a job with no passion, surprisingly. Uh, <laughs> the so, future. <laughs> the future, yeah. Um, so like, I don't know. Just keep your options open and so, yeah. Well, I had the, uh, I had the opportunity once to write for a, uh, a guy named um, John Duan in Chicago for something called Chicago Baseball Reports. And I was paid, uh, I remember working untold hours and I made 750 bucks, you know, for the summer. Uh, and so he asked me to come back the next year and I said, no, I can't do it. I had children and uh, another full-time job and so forth. That, that then turned into Stats Incorporated uh, and the guy re uh, sold it for, I think he sold it to I don't know, Bloomberg or somebody for one billion dollars or something like that. So you gotta you gotta keep you know even when you get older you've got to keep those uh, that uh, idea of taking a few risks out there too, even if you're not going to get paid a lot for it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if there wasn't if there isn't like mentors set up, find a mentor. Um, that's really helpful. Um, I, I mean, I had mentors who were professors, which I really loved. I also had a mentor who was just a colleague of mine in a, in a job that I worked throughout college. Um, and she just was somebody who was older, who was working it as a part-time job. And, um, you know, find people in non-traditional spaces that might be mentors to you. She still is a mentor of mine. She'll look at my resume. She'll, you know, and she's just, she just has an eye for that. Um, she'll tell me when I need to argue up my salary, things like that. So, you know, you can find mentors in non-traditional spaces as well. And I think they can give you, they're just an extra set of eyes sometimes on work. Um, or an extra set of eyes if you're, if you're worried that you might be going off the path. Um, so find mentors. Um, I would recommend trying to find mentors who aren't like your parents. My parents are amazing, but they're normally a little not as critical as I want them to be because they love me so much. They'll be like, oh my gosh, that was great. Or I got rejected from my grad school. My dad was like, there's something major wrong with those people. And I was like, it's okay. Like maybe I did, maybe I'm just not the right candidate. So find people that are, I would say outside of your family who can serve as mentors. Um, and you don't have to like, it doesn't have to be a mentor program or anything like that, but just somebody who you can look up to or just ask questions to um, who can kind of help guide you. If we, we have one more question maybe, it is, we're running over time here, but yeah. Yeah, I definitely say it's fluid. I feel like you learn a lot on the job. Um, like my internship, it's I learned so many new things that I really didn't learn in school. Just because it's you're in ex like you're you're facing these new experiences that like really you can't take a class on. So I feel like it's really fluid. Like I work with people who got their degree in marketing or in art or like it's really a very fluid. Um, it's not kind of all about your experience. Do you do? PR and advertising at your agency? Just advertising, but at, at my agency, yeah, we do ad and PR. At, at what? At Periscope, they're ad and PR. Ad and PR, yep. both. They, so there's lots of times those things are combined now yep. because uh, I've always wondered how you can do one without the other. Yep. You know, so. But like I work with someone, she graduated the same year I did. She was a marketing major and she now works in PR. Um, so it's kind of fluid. When, one thing about uh, that, if you have good writing <laughs> skills, uh, that's going to give you the kind of fluidity that you want because every you know, ad and PR, uh, you, you're a marketing major, but if you've got those writing skills and communication skills, then uh, you can, you have a lot of flexibility in what you can do. Uh, thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you for coming and um, uh, have a good evening. <laughs>